I think of Jesus dealing with the ministry of the Pharisees, right? It was, they, they didn't keep the law of Moses, but they didn't see that they didn't keep the law of Moses. So what their ministry became was sort of club, club sort of, you know, legalism. Whereas, you know, they, they, they were, they were grumpy, gate, gate tre- uh, keepers of the tradition. They're angry. They're setting hedges around the law, building more hedges and more hedges. Can you imagine hanging out with those guys? Oh. That'd be exhausting. Yeah, they're always, I, I think, <laughs> I think the whole thing has got to be polemical the whole time, right? It's like, it, it, you <sighs> always be aware of like ministries that are only polemical, right? Yeah. That's Pharisee. Like, oh. That's Pharisee style because they're always angry. They're always critiquing. They're always beating. They're always, um, you know, pounding somebody. And you're not, anyone who's doing that has a serious issue themselves with their, with, with the Lord. Like they need, they haven't enjoyed his forgiveness yet because the forgiveness of Christ, the gospel, it's, it has a softening effect on us. Yeah. Like it, it has a humbling effect on us. And we then begin to be burdened for those who don't know that. So, so we have an aim in preaching, right? We preach, there's first use of the law. We preach to crush. We preach to condemn. We don't know all the hearts sitting out there. Of course, if, if it, listen, the law standard is very strong. You know, right? You do this and be holy. You, you, he demands complete and perfect righteousness. God's holy. Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you're not making it. Well, that's a big problem. They were known as the best. So we, we preach that first use, but it has a goal. Yeah. The goal is not to, to say, I'm going to pound them into conformity. The goal is to kill them in their old self and raise them up in Christ and then to preach the law in such a way that teaches them how to be thankful. Yeah. You know? And we wouldn't do this necessarily from the pulpit because we want to preach to everyone. But when we do have encounters with those legalistic types like the Pharisees, we bring the law both barrels. Mm -hmm. They need to be crushed with the law. Just the Jesus with the rich young ruler. He had to crush him with the law. Mm -hmm. So don't think that this is soft peddling the law in any way. Right. Or that, you know, we're just trying to package this in a, an easy way. No, those who are, as you said, denying the reality of their sinfulness need to be awakened to that like a two by four to the face. Yeah. Yeah. I was preaching John the Baptist the other night. Wow. Dude, he's, he thought, so you the, brood he, of vipers. He, yeah. Here come the Sadducees and the Pharisees, obviously a delegation to come inspect this, you know, ninth century prophet and camel's hair and has a following like this. And the first thing he says is you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. He's being sarcastic. Yeah. I didn't. Who yeah. told you to come? You know? And he's like, and don't think, you know, you can, you know, have Abraham as your father. God's able to, ra-. you know, he's just, he's going off. And then he says, the ax is laid to the root of the trees. He says, you repent. So there's a, there's a heavy, heavy hand of the law on those guys. Um, and, and, and what's know, the purpose of that? The, the purpose, purpose is not to, to ridicule them, right. to condemn them. The purpose is that the Holy Spirit would use that Convict to them. drive them to repentance. Now, of course, we don't see that in the text of Scripture. Sadly, they weren't driven to repentance. Yeah. But that's the goal. And I think the level of the confrontation exposes the level of the hardness of their hearts. Yeah. In other words, you don't hear him saying that to the masses. Sure, he's preaching the right. law of the masses. But those people who are coming to be baptized, that was the intended response. Goal achieved. Now receive yes. forgiveness. Yes. Receive what this points to, the washing away of your sins. Right. This is beautiful. These guys are coming with hard hearts. They're getting the book thrown at them. Yes. You know? They need to hear that crushing of the law because, yeah, as you said, those who are getting baptized in repentance for forgiveness of sins, they already had come to that point. Right. They'd already been crushed by the law. Right. They were coming now for forgiveness, repentance, and uh, forgiveness of sins. So, yes, we, we crush with the law. Uh, those who need to be crushed, and we offer the comfort of the gospel to everyone. Right? There's hope. So, yeah, it's not just condemn them and offer no hope. Right? It's behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And then you know, once once we've preached the beauties of Christ, Sinclair Ferguson talks about this preaching Christ in the in his glorious robes. It's just beautiful. Be- the privilege to do that. I have to say, I love. 
I love, I really enjoy as a pastor instructing God's people on how to live. There's nothing, th- th- that's a beautiful thing to do. Yeah. If this text is doing that, if you're preaching an imperative, tell them how to walk worthy of the calling that they have. That's one of our responsibilities. Any redemptive historical preacher who denies that is not is not pre- being fair to the whole counsel of God. Right. right. So, and we can't say, we don't say that you can't do this. This is one of the incessantly. Yeah, this is one of the um, criticisms of redemptive historical preaching, as you said. That well, you're never going to do this. So Jesus did it for you. Blah blah blah. No problem. No. We can do this right. as we're empowered by the Holy Spirit. Now, will we perfectly? Of course not. Maybe in a, we'll have small beginnings of this, as our catechism says. Right. But we will violate the law in every way. But that doesn't mean we can't fulfill the law. There is progress. Yes. We have the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. So we can be obedient to Christ. Right. So it's not just this, oh, well, whatever. I can't do it anyway, so I'm just going to keep sinning. Right. Jesus kept it for me. You know, this like laissez-faire kind of attitude in Christian life. That's not true at all. Right. This is such a good point, Dan. Yeah, we strive for obedience out of gratitude because we can walk in obedience, not for us, not because we're great, special people, whatever, but because we have the Holy Spirit. Yeah, it's interesting in our Heidelberg that, you know, it makes this, that statement, you know, even the holiest in this life make a small beginning in this new obedience. So that's a confessional statement. Like, if I said that, I shouldn't be accused of being an antinomian, right? right? You know? Right. Um, you know, and I always ask the question, it, the holiest, what about the least holy? Right. Like, if the most holy make a small <laughs> beginning, what do the least holy make? Does that make you uncomfortable? Yeah. Right? You got to ask people that. But then the catechism does go on and say, listen, but we do begin to make progress. We do begin yeah. to be obedient. We do begin to be conformed. And not just some, but all of God's commandments, Right. Right. So there is, it doesn't set, it doesn't like present to us this Christian life as total defeatist and failure. We're realistic about sin. Right. We're realistic about the problem of sin, but there is indeed active conforming to the image of Christ by the Spirit. If you, by the Spirit, put to death the deeds of the body, you'll live. That's that's part of what the Spirit's doing in us, right? And that's not to, the, the point is to elevate the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives. I was talking the other day, uh, preaching through the Belgian Confession. I was mentioning those who were martyred for the faith. Guido de Bray wrote the Belgian Confession, martyred for the faith. All those in the 16th and 17th centuries who suffered for the faith, they, you know, Guido de Bray is literally running for his life Mm -hmm. and he's still preaching to people in the the hedgerows of the, the fields, preaching the gospel while the Catholics are trying to kill him. And I said, look, these are not supermen. These are ordinary Christians. We look at their lives, these amazing mm-hmm. testimonies of faithfulness to God in the midst of horrific persecution. We think, I could never do that. And I told our congregation, that's right. You could never do that. Right. But the Holy Spirit can do that through you. Mm-hmm. These guys were not supermen. They weren't floating across the room with some supernatural power. They're as ordinary as we are but the Holy Spirit worked through them in an extraordinary way. And so if we are called to such things, he will work through us in such an extraordinary way as well. Doesn't mean we're super spiritual Christians. It means we have an amazing Holy Spirit who can can bear us up Mm -hmm. even in the most unbelievable persecution. Yeah, I mean, does anyone think Polycarp was able to do what he did on his own power? Yeah. I mean, come on. If you're called to suffer martyrdom, you're not doing that in your own strength. Right. Like, that's, I think, what we think. Like, oh, well, now I'm on my own. I don't know how I could do that. You can't. Right. <laughs> like, Peter already denied to prove. Yeah. You can't. That's why the Holy Spirit's given to you. That's why Daniel's friends were able to go into the furnace. Um, one was with them in there. So yeah. the point the point is, is that you're you're absolutely right. We are making progress because it's the Spirit's work. He's completing the work he began. He's sanctifying us according to the truth. You know, it's interesting though, getting back to the sort of, you know, charge um, that redemptive historical preaching, you know, is antinomian or can lead to antinomianism and these sort of things. All these straw men are always set up. You know, Paul would have been accused of that. Yeah. You know, um, we know all things work together for good to those who love God, Romans 8. 
to those who are the called according to his purpose, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he called. Whom he called, these he justified. Whom he justified, these he glorified. Paul, 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 wait, you missed sanctification, man. <laughs> you jumped from justification to glorification? Come on, that's so antinomian. What are you doing? How could you just skip the whole category of sanctification? If you read Boyce on that, he says, it's because Paul wanted everyone to understand your sanctification is not the basis of your right standing with God and the basis of you going to glory. Yeah. It's not the basis, your performance. That's at least Boyce's, Boyce's position. He was no antinomian. And we have to understand that, yes, we are not entirely passive in sanctification, but it is just as monergistic as our justification. Right. God is doing everything. Right. We get no credit for the work that he's doing within us. He's doing the work. Are, do we see uh, obedience in our lives in every part of the law? Yes, the small beginning of obedience. Do I get credit for that? Absolutely not. It's the Holy Spirit yeah. working through me. It's God doing this. So we don't think like, some Some people seem to have this impression that justification is monergistic, only God, right. and sanctification is right. synergistic right. now. Right. Like it's part me and part God. Like which part is yours? Yeah. Well, my part's the sin part. <laughs> That's for <laughs> yeah. sure. Yeah. His part is the holiness part. Yeah. It, it's, I get none of the holiness part. I get no credit for that. It's him doing it within us. Yeah. Yeah, that, I mean that that Paul makes that so clear. Yeah, in, in numerous places, um, and and we we make by the Spirit's power an earnest endeavor to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. I mean that's what we do. Yeah, uh, there is a beginning in that. There is progress in that, and it's not that anyone who's in glory made you know absolutely no progress in that. It, that's what Heidelberg's saying to us. Think of the thief on the cross. Did he make progress? He did. He did. Yeah, he clung to Christ. He believed that he believed those promises, and his good work was he admonished that man next to him yeah. <laughs> for not believing. So there you go. Um, it was it's not going to be a great tally of works, <laughs> but um, Jesus said, "You're with me today in paradise." Yeah, by faith alone, he he received the kingdom. Right, right. Always remember, it is God who works within us mm -hmm. to do His good pleasure. So right. God is the one working within us at every point. We should not despair. We should not uh, have an unhealthy opinion of ourselves, a pharisaical way, like, oh, I'm, I'm pretty good at keeping the law. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, anything, we, anything good that we do, all the credit goes to God. And to think about now in light of this title, you know, Moses, you know, centered legalism, that means that the ministry that we're under is going to be a ministry of righteousness if, if it's from the Lord. It's not going to be a ministry of condemnation. So those categories are really important for those watching. There's a ministry of righteousness that brings you Christ that sets you free. And there is a ministry of condemnation. In other words, you can hear a lot of people say, man, I went to a service today. I felt so convicted. And the pastor really drilled it home on me. Pastor really preached a good one on me. And I felt good about that. You may have just received the ministry of condemnation. In other words, you were left with no, no help at all from the Lord. The aim of that was purely legal. And the tone was probably legal. It's important. You know, I always think when we give the benediction, you know, you take the numbers, the Aaronic benediction, we're communicating God's smiling face upon the people. People have a hard time with that, Dan. People don't believe that God, obviously, we're anthropomorphic, but that, that God is actually favoring his people, loving his people, not yeah. against his people. There's no more condemnation upon his people. They're no longer under the law, but under grace. Whoa. You know, that they struggle with that. Yeah. So that, that sort of ministry has to be communicated. That has to be the aim of it, as opposed to the Pharisees ministry, which was a ministry of condemnation. They put people under it and they left them there. Yeah. And that's the key, leaving them there. I was talking to somebody one time who was struggling with um, feelings of guilt and regret and remorse. And I said, it's good to be reflective, to evaluate our actions, to repent. 
And that's Romans 7, mm-hmm. when Paul looks at his own sinfulness, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death. We need that. We need to confess our sins. We need to examine ourselves, repent of those things. But we can't stay in Romans 7. Right. You have to get to Romans 8. And so many people, as you just said, seem to be living in Romans 7. Right. In despair. And their churches leave them there. Mm -hmm. And their pastor (laughs) clubs them over the head on the Lord's Day with Romans 7. You have to get to Romans 8. There is therefore now no condemnation in Christ Jesus. There's a categorical change that is made there. Transformative change. Yes. And that is crucial for the Christian life. Our people need to hear that every Lord's Day. Mm -hmm. There is no condemnation for you in Christ. Rest in that. And now because of this, again, it's Romans 7, examining our sin, confessing, repenting, all that. Romans 8, no condemnation. But the result now is not, then go live like a pirate. (laughs) Antinomianism. Right, right. Oh, you're not condemned in Christ. Do whatever you want. Live it up. No. That's the straw man that keeps coming. That's ridiculous. The result then is now walk in obedience Mm -hmm. because of what Christ has done for you empowered by what Christ has done for you, empowered by the gospel, not walking in our own strength, but by the power of the Holy Spirit as we are motivated, fueled by the gospel every Lord's Day. Yeah. This is the progression that we experience in the Christian life. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. And um, you set people free this way. I remember I had a, a wise minister say to me going into ministry, Chris, set your people free. Set them free. That always stuck with me. Set them free. You'll see the power in their life of the gospel. What he was meaning is, as you as you make known Christ's love and forgiveness and gospel to them, it will set them free and they will want to be. Yes. They will want to be sincerely followers of Christ. Right. That, 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 that won't be, it won't be this, you know, I can never do it, I can never do it. No, they understand Christ has accomplished it for them and now for that the condemnation is over Therefore, now having that status change, they live in the joy of this comfort. So they begin to pursue right. what, what God has for them. I just finished preaching through the fifth head of doctrine in the Canons of Dort on perseverance. And we say the perseverance of the saints, but really it's the perseverance of Christ. It's the preservation of Christ. Christ preserving us uh, in his hand all the way to the end of this life, into the life to come. And it's so sad that the Arminians get it flipped. And the delegates of the Synod of Dort were so wise in their evaluation of Arminianism and then in their application of biblical theology, Reformed theology, to the people. And this is one thing that really bothers me when I hear people criticize the canons of Dort as mm-hmm. some sort of a an exclusively polemical document. Yeah. Just a hit no, job against the Arminians. Around. Right. The sterile, cold... Yeah. Five points of Calvinism. That's all it is. No. If you read, if you actually read the Canons of Dort, (laughs) it's impossible not to see the pastoral warmth that leaps off of every page of the Canons. They wrote these not to crush the Armenians. They wrote them to care for people's souls. They were written to benefit the people in the pew, that they would have comfort in the truths of Scripture. And it's so sad that the Arminians say, you must have obedience to God, you must persevere, and then you will have comfort. Right. Whereas the canons say, we have perseverance in Christ, we are safe in Christ, and then now we have comfort, and that leads to obedience. It starts with the gospel, it starts with comfort, preservation in Christ, and that produces obedience. Mm -hmm. Whereas, sadly, again, the Arminians start with the law and say, well, if you keep the law well enough, well, then you'll have comfort. And you're never going to get that comfort because you can't keep the law well enough. Right. I think it's a really important point to go back to the canons as pastorals they are, because I think a lot of these 
Modern discussions on these issues demonstrate how Arminian the whole discussion has become. Come on. <laughs> you know, it's so Arminian. And those categories aren't talking. I mean, that was that was in vogue in the 90s to talk about right. Arminianism. It's not in vogue anymore. Listen, um, much of what I hear in these critiques, especially when it comes to antinomian critiques, antinomian critiques, and that just careless use of the charge, their answer comes back to sort of latent antinomianism where it's putting a lot more burden back on us to fulfill righteousness. Yeah. And I I mean that's you're not setting your people free that way. So Yeah, I would love to take a an honest anonymous poll of those congregations of people who sit under that heavy uh what did you call it mosaic <laughs> Moses centered legalism. Moses centered legalism. Those those poor saints in those yeah, churches are probably just in despair. They're crushed every week yeah. without much hope of um, assurance in the Christian life because they know they're not meeting God's standard. Mm-hmm. And what do they hear? Just more and more beating of the sheep. Whereas we need to give our people comfort, give them hope. As you said, release them, free them from the bondage of the law so that we can walk in obedience, but only because the gospel comes first. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again in the yoke of bondage. And, um, and, and you know, if you think about those fruits of what you're saying, what will a legal ministry, what will a ministry of condemnation produce in the life of its people, in the life of the church? It's this. The works of the flesh. Yeah. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred. This is this is where the the real it really becomes strong. Hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambition, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. Those are the fruits of the ministry of condemnation. In other words, what did Paul say in Romans 7? That actually the law has the effect of arousing sin. Yeah. If you're leaving people there, that's you're gonna have you're gonna have a battered people and the people who become fighters. They're gonna become angry. There's gonna be no joy. But the ministry of the spirit, which is the ministry of righteousness, you know, what does he say? Is gonna produce this love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. <laughs> and and he's not saying that. The law doesn't matter anymore. What he's saying is, when those things are practiced, you're honoring the law. Yeah, you're honoring what the intention of the law is. So, if we live by in the Spirit, let us walk by the Spirit. So, you know, I, it's important that our people think through these things in these categories because sitting under a legal ministry for you and your children, a ministry of condemnation, is going to have bad fruit. Yeah, you know. So, yeah, we need to give people comfort. Yeah. Well, um, if you have any questions, write Dan Borvin. He'll answer all of them. Christ United Report. (laughs) (laughs) But anyways, always good to have you on the program. Thanks, Dan, for all the insights. Thanks. 